Your friends are scrolling through short content, but you, my friend, you're here to learn. Welcome to the RS Clips. Do you have any experiences from Australia? I have a ton, uh, but I'd love to hear some of yours. Maybe I'll give us a little bit of a context on the Aboriginal people to those of uh, the audience members that haven't heard of them. Um, so I'll give a bit of context on the Aboriginal people. Basically, when you go to Australia now, if you go to the big cities, it's multicultural. Uh, it's a lot of white folks and then it's like people from other countries who've migrated there. Uh, they all acknowledge the fact that Australia was originally inhabited by the Aboriginal people. Uh, when you actually get into studying Aboriginal history, you go to these Aboriginal centers, uh, they will kind of let you in a little bit on their culture. Not completely. Not, not, not much. For some reason, they're very guarded about it. Well, partly because of all the white people who came there and, and afflicted them for so many years. Uh, I believe that around 1500 is when European imperialism started all over the globe. Uh, you know, I, in that time, Bharat, India was uh, basically the richest part of the world. So I don't think European imperialism could just go into India and dominate. But Australia wasn't really a rich part of the world. They were still kind of very linked with the land. They were living off the land. Uh, it's said that when the European imperialists actually arrived in Australia, they even did things like uh, they classified the aboriginals as flora and fauna and told their own people that it's okay to hunt these other people. And, the, and that law was still on the books even in the like the 1940s or the 1950s. It wow. was only repealed then. And if you, if you talk to the aboriginal people today, like the descendants, a lot of them are of mixed heritage. They have a lot yes. of white blood as well. Yes. They have this weird sense of um, generational trauma mixed with a little guilt. Uh, so it's it's very difficult conversations with them. You, you sense it, especially when they're talking about their own culture. It's very intricate. Uh, lots of different tools, lots of different uh, uh, ways of life. Uh, you know, they were all family-oriented people, had nuclear families, etc. But if you draw the map of Australia, each tiny part of Australia is divided according to one of their tribes. And there was a bunch of these tribes. Each tribe has something called a... I forgot the word, but it's kind of like a mascot. It's an animal that represents that tribe. Some people you call that a totem. Totem, yeah. Uh, so... Uh, you'd see that, I mean, this is something I spoke to a bunch of them about. I said that, so say if your totem is the Tasmanian tiger, does it mean that you guys also inherit traits of the Tasmanian tiger? And a bunch of them said, yes, that's exactly what it is. So if your totem is the orca, you know, like a, a sea animal, you'll see that people from that tribe are a little more relaxed, a little more kind of seaside oriented. Of course, that's an outcome of geography as well, but they're very connected to their totems. I've actually had some occult experiences on that same trip, which I choose not to talk about. Right. Uh, but very intricate culture. And every time you talk to them as an Indian and you share some of your Indian outlooks, like when I spoke to them about Bhumima or Devi, they all got emotional. They were like, this and this is very similar. They did feel a bit of brotherhood with myself and my Indian guys with me. So there's some kind of deep connection between India and Aboriginal Australia for sure. But I'd love to hear your thoughts, sir. Well, I, I think the, the, the most important thing is that they don't, and I think this is true generally of uh, indigenous people in the Americas also, they don't regard themselves, they don't think of humans as being separate or better than all the other animals and plants. They regard themselves as being very much a part of the environment in which they live. And that's why the land is so important to them. And that's why specific areas, and you know, they've had tens of thousands of years, so they've had plenty of time to know which areas men are, is, is meant for the men to relate to and which areas to relate to the women to relate to. And in that area where that tribe is, the, their, the people in the tribe, it's their responsibility to look after those parts of the land to make sure that the land and the humans and the animals and the plants all work together and 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 maintain a healthy ecology. And of course, we human beings think that nowadays, the modern human being, we think that everything else is is somehow meant for us to exploit. And that's totally different from the way that they believe and from the way that most um, 
uh, 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 most traditional people of traditional cultures believe. I can say that, um, it, uh, I, I, as I, uh, as I said, I, I haven't spent a lot of time with Aboriginal people uh, in Australia, but the place that I've been going to for the past uh, 25 years uh, is a place where the original people there, um, their totem animals were the uh, iguana, or the goanna, they call it in Australia, and the python. And so uh, it has been very interesting for me to interact with those animals because where my friend lives, uh, pythons periodically enter the house and wander around and the iguanas will wander around and so on because they they understand that she accepts her her herself as being part of that environment she's not trying to keep them out and 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 maintain a different a distance between them she's willing to enter into a relationship with them and then it works very well for her Okay, I'm not going to reveal the entire story here because I've been told not to, but I'll reveal a part of it. Um, we did this Aboriginal tour on the last day of our trip. Uh, we met someone who was from the tribe whose totem was a crow. Now, crows are actually very, very rare in Australia. Like in my entire Australian trip, I didn't see any crows. Very rare. Like we didn't see any crows across three or four cities that we visited. Now we go into this guy's land uh, their temples are actually small pockets of land, either like, you know, a, a grove or like the edge of a cliff. Uh, those are their temples. So he took us there. He said that in my culture, in my tribe, if I have welcomed you into my land, now you're a part of my tribe. That's what my tribe believes. So he did an initiation ceremony. Like he said that now you're a part of my tribe. You're like a brother to me. He said that, do you allow me to invite you into my tribe? So we said, yes. He said, okay, stand. He made the three of us stand. Three Indian guys, he's feeling a connect with us. And then he started chanting. He started clicking and chanting. And those chants were just like bhajans. Okay, and all of us are in that bit of a trance with him. That What's he doing? What's this bhajan? And three crows came and sat right next to us. And all three of us are looking at each other like, what is happening here? And that's when you realize that these ancient people knew a lot more about mother nature than modern people do. And a lot more happened on that same trip, in that same story, which I choose not to reveal. But uh, there's some strange connection between animals and humans that modern day humans have forgotten about. And if you make the mistake <clears throat> of interfering with the animal and not treating it with respect, um, at, the, at, at this house of my friend, she was gone for a few months and she allowed a couple of an, an Australian couple to live there. And, you know, they're not ignorant people, but he one day, I, I don't know, there was a python there and maybe he kicked it or something. And the next day, in the evening, he was at the side of the house and he could fe feel something dripping onto him. And he looked up and right above him, about, you know, a half a meter above him, there was a python. And, you know, they can unhinge their jaws. And she had opened her mouth and just as he looked up, she vomited a half-eaten rat on top of him <sighs> with a bunch of, of, of maggots and all kinds of other things. <laughs> and now at least he knows to be more respectful, see. But, I mean, it's, you, when you're in a place like that, or, you know, Vimal Ananda would have called it a place that's jagrat, that's alive, you have to be careful. And you, you, you want to... It's like going anywhere where there's powerful, powerful things, powerful people. You have yeah. to be polite. A bunch of the Australian Aboriginals that I met asked me about the importance of animals in Hindu culture. So I said that the only thing I can think of is the Vahans. Like the um, each, like basically each god has his or her own favorite animal. And maybe those animals are sort of linked to the traits of that god. Okay. Cut to... A couple of months ago, I was in Udaipur. Uh, there's a hotel called the Uday Vilas. The land that the Uday Vilas is made on, uh, they had found a Kartikeya statue on that land. Uh, that land is also supposed to be the home to a lot of peacocks. And the staff at the Uday Vilas says that very often early in the morning when the sun hits the statue, 
a lot of the peacocks in Uday Villas will actually go and stand right next to the statue. And Kartikeya statue also has a peacock as its own vahan. Yes. This, so this is the parallel that I thought was very similar to Aboriginal culture, where there's such a deep relationship with animals. There's something in the world of animal consciousness that we're yet to understand. That's what I strongly believe. That people like the Aboriginals have not forgotten yet. Yes. The thing is that we're modern humans and we've forgotten so many things. Yeah. They say that about Bhairav Upasana as well, that if you begin worshipping Kal Bhairav uh, or any of the Bhairavs, dogs are very drawn to you and dogs won't uh, get aggressive with you. I don't know how true that is, but uh, I have noticed this. Some, some Well... Sometimes they won't get aggressive with you. Sometimes uh, I remember going just uh, about a year ago, going to uh, the inauguration of a Kalabaitav temple in Tamil Nadu. And the next day, I mean, I was in, I was, I wasn't at the temple. I was probably an hour away, but I was, you know, and there was, uh, I was walking along and um, a, a watchdog broke its chain and came over and just grazed my leg, but enough to draw blood. So sometimes the deity might want some blood and the dog will, so, you know, I didn't end up, it didn't even, it, it didn't break, uh, it didn't cut my uh, pajama. It broke the skin though. So I wasn't worried about getting rabies, <laughs> but I did offer the blood. And so it depends on the relationship that you have with the deity. So the dogs definitely are not going to uh, start coming to attack you if you are seriously connected to Kal Bhairava because Kal Bhairava will discourage that from happening. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure you check out this playlist for more videos just like this. It's the artist clips. <laughs>